Thanks so much for being here today. Uh, my name is Carlos de la Torre. I'm the director for the Center for Latin American Studies at the University of Florida. And I am extremely excited that Pablo Herrera Beitia is going to give a lecture to us on uh, Afro-Cuban music. And um, I really want to thank him for all of the support that he has given us to, at the center last semester in, by accepting to give this talk. And without further talking, I would like to give the floor to Professor Tanya Saunders, who's the organizer of this event. Thanks so much for being here, Pablo and Tanya. Thank you, Carlos. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, again, thanks um, for everyone who's here. Thank you, Carlos, uh, for supporting the event. Thank you, Pablo, for your presence today. Um, I'm Dr. Tanya Saunders. I'm an associate professor in the Center for Latin American Studies. And I'm going to go ahead and just uh, read a little bit about Pablo uh, as part of his introduction. Pablo de Herrera Vetia is currently a PhD candidate in social anthropology at the University of St. Andrews, UK, arguably Cuba's most influential beat maker and a pioneer of the Afro-Cuban and Cuban hip hop sounds. His research follows the question, what is it like to be Afro-Cuban in Havana today? It explores how the presence of amplified urban Cuban music in public and domestic settings may be construed as a form of citizenship. Herrera Betia was the recipient of the 2018-2019 Nasir Jones Fellowship at the Hip Hop Archive and Research Institute, Hutchins Center for the American for African and African American Research at Harvard University. Hearing Afro-Cuban rap, the archival project that he began in collaboration with the HARI, uh, the Hip Hop Archives, and uh, Lieb Music Library treats golden era Afro-Cuban rap songs in particular as the meaningful ethnogra ethnographies that best articulate the counter narratives that drove the racial debate into Cuba's public sphere between 1995 and 2004. His writing has appeared in Cuba's in many Cuban influential Cuban journals, um, such as the Revista Casa de las Americas, and most recently in okafrica.com. So his work has appeared in journals across the diaspora, across the world. Um, and his work has also been translated into uh, several languages. Pablo, uh, Pablo Herrera Betia has collaborated in several major academic research projects on rap, reggaeton music in Havana. Some of those projects include Sujata Fernandez's Cuba Represent and close to the edge. Um, and my book, my work, um, the Cuban Cuban Underground Hip Hop, and in Mark Perry's book, Negro Soy Yo, and Geoff Baker's Buena Vista in the Club, in the Club. To his credit, as a cultural producer, to his credit as a cultural producer, goes the coordination of the Black August Collective showcases in Havana. A series of US Cuba people to people music events uh, Black August brought to Havana's international brought to Havana's international rap festival presentations by Mosta and Tali Kuali's Black Star, High Tech, Dead Prez, Common, Tony Touch, and the project load and the um, and project load between 1998 and 2002. He was also instrumental in the Roots concert in Havana, amongst other projects. And the amongst other projects is key. Um, he's a very active producer. Uh, very active artist, very prolific poet and writer and scholar. So welcome, Pablo. We're so happy to have you join us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Tanya. And hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to read from a text I wrote so I can make sure that I that I this, do this properly. Uh, my name is Pablo Demetrio Herrera Vitia. I'm a PhD candidate in social anthropology at the University of St. Andrews. Uh, before I go in, I want to say rest in peace, you know, Notorious B.I.G. Today is um, the 9th of March is an anniversary of, his, I, think his, I think his passing or his death. But today uh, it's a commemoration of you know, another year of Biggie Small. So uh, for those who are rap aficionados and rap fans, you probably know about this a little better than me. So just before I go into the whole discussion, I wanted to make sure that 
I thank uh, Professor Tanya Saunders and Professor Carlos de la Torre and the staff of the Center of La for Latin American Studies at the University of Florida in Gainesville for the invitation to present this lecture. Um, in, in, the, in the presentations I've, I have studied to try to do this one good, I, usually people do, people start out with some sort of icebreaker and then they go, you know, they say something just to make sure that people, you know, they, they, they can test, uh, they have a good temperature of people who are listening to them and then they go on and give lectures. So me saying this is sort of my icebreaker, right? The other thing that I wanted to start out before I go in uh, is something that I couldn't really totally include in the paper that I'm that I, in, the, in this sort of lecture that I'm giving in today, but it's basically this idea of what you know, what an Afro-Cuban theory um, would be of sound, right? I was actually in in, in an initial orientation to this uh, towards this idea of an Afro-Cuban uh, uh, idea of sound has to, it has a religious uh, connotation. I was spoke to, I was speaking yesterday with the Baba Lao. I'm also an initiate of Ifa, but he's a Baba Lao. I'm just in, I'm just initiated in Ifa divination, which is um, it's a, it's a religious form uh, that exists in Cuba, whereby through uh, oracular forms or archetypical forms, we um, can understand past, present, and future and you know produce prophecy so in one of those oracular forms that, 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 that we use to understand reality in our lives as africans uh through a father every nation and and uh, but this this baba Lao, whose name is um um jorge gallo he was saying that all do a yobe talks about this idea of how music and, and how important it is for us to be able to listen properly, right? So how Baba Lao or an initiate, and also this is also applicable to, to people in general, people who are not initiated, how it's important to first listen, then interpret. And then um, I, I read you the quote, what, what it says. She says, first it's important to listen, interpret, analyze, and then apply the knowledge. So listening is also a practice. And this is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to situate what I'm going to say with this, within this realm of Afro-Cuban uh, 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 religious thought to make sure that I am, I, I'm anchoring what I'm going to say from now on within this, this body of literature that is uh, religiously Afro-Cuban. And uh, we can probably talk about this much, but I just wanted to say again, Odu Ejiobe says listening is important because it allows us to, to get a sense of reality. Then we interpret what is being said, then we analyze that, and then we apply that knowledge, right? And uh, and and I, I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. His name is Jorge Gallo. So with that said, I'm going to go into the text that I wanted to present today, which is uh, towards uh, uh, an, Af an acoustomology of Afro-Cuban rap. So the blurb that I that, that I sent to describe a presentation. Uh, today starts with the question, what is the nature of Afro-Cuban rap music? Um, Afro-Cuban rap music, I argue, is inherently transgressive. However, I believe that my answer requires a presentation of some context. For the purpose of that, I have decided, for the purpose of giving you some context, I've decided to divide this presentation into three parts. The first part is a it's a description of my doctoral research and how I embarked in, in, in it and like basically the motivation and the topic of it. The second part will be an introduction to my methodology. And then the third part would be a presentation of, of towards um, an acoustomology of Afro-Cuban rap. Now, having said that, the title of my, of my, uh, of my presentation, of my, uh, sorry, the working title of my dissertation is Havana's Noise and Rhythm, Understanding Afro-Cubaneity. I'm a born and raised Negro Habanero, a black man from Havana in Afro-Cuban. I grew up in the neighborhood of Santo Suarez, right at the geographic center of the city. The claim to be Afro-Cuban seems self-evident to me but what is Afro-Cubaneity, right? Um, the, this question is basically at the center of my research project. It departed from my lived experience as a black man with several initiations 
in Afro-Cuban Santeria and uh, Ifa Divination. It departed from my experience as a Black listener, my work as an Afro-Cuban rap music producer, and my participation in several academic books that attempted to make sense of Cuban society during the advent of Afro-Cuban rap and the fall of its overt treatment of Cuban racial politics through music, specifically within the years 1995 and 2002. So book examples that I usually give in this sense, I think Tanya introduced those books already, but I want to sort of go over them again. In chronological order is Sujata Fernandez's uh, Cuba Represent, which is a masterful ethnographic account of how the Cuban government reproduces its power by co-opting any oppositional ideologies coming from Cuba's cultural sphere. Then the second book would be Jeff Baker's Buena Vista in the Club, uh, which is an in-depth ethnomusicological study of the tension between Afro-Cuban raps, racial politics, and Cuban reggaeton polit politics of dancing. And this politics of dancing is something that Jeff uh, Baker sort of initiated this idea that, that, that dance itself is a political form, right? Then there is uh, my, dearest, my dearest work, Tanya Saunders' work, which is uh, uh, Cuban underground hip hop, which is a powerful, powerful sociological examination of the Cuban hip hop underground movement and why it needs to be understood as part of, this, of, of a transnational challenge to the larger structure of coloniality in the Americas. And lastly, there'll be Mark Perry's book, Negro Soy Yo, which is a meticulous ethnography on what are the visible um, effects that Cuba's transition from socialism to Cuba's present ambivalent relationship with neoliberalism have had on Afro-Cuban racialized citizenship. So by the time I decided to embark on my project of academic research, there was also an existence, uh, in existence a plethora of academic, you know, newspapers and uh, academic work documentaries that have also been produced within Cuba in response to the emergence of local rap music. However, while those sources outside and inside Cuba cover a range of details about the Cuban hip hop, about Cuban hip hop culture, I felt like the questions that I attempted to articulate through my practice and the questions I was asking my reality were not clearly defined and or, or in, in a defined way answered in any of, of these projects, right? So specifically, there, there were two arguments that started me and that they were, were, were the things that kept me thinking that I was basically trying to find answers. Although I found some indirect answers in some of these books, the specific questions that I had were basically one, one this argument from Jack Satali, uh, who says, you, you know, that music is prophecy. It makes audible the new world that will gradually become visible, that will impose itself and regulate the order of things. It is not only the image of things, but the transcending of the everyday, the herald of the future. And and this particular, I don't know if you can you see, is it possible to move? Maybe I can move it. Maybe it's better if I can move it myself. But I, I don't know if you can see the whole question behind it. But that question says, what does urban Afro-Cuban music can, you know, can tell about the future of Cuban society based on this question that Jack Satali is proposing, this idea that music is prophecy? It made me think, so if music is prophecy, what is Afro-Cuban music, urban music saying about the future of Cuban society, right? And that that puzzle was something that triggered me and made me, you know, try to think about how do I how do how do I think about this? So I kept on thinking, and then also I encountered the work of David Scott, um, in in uh, Conscript uh, of Modernity, where he poses this sort of really really compelling argument that anti basically he says you know everywhere anti colonial almost everywhere anti colonial utopias have gradually withered into post colonial nightmares, um. When I thought about that, and, and I, 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 I couldn't help but look at Cuba and look at my people and my community and Afro-Cubans and just think, you know, what, you know, what does urban music say about the future of Afro-Cuban life in Havana? So with this sort of, with, you know, with this sort of questions is how I enter this idea, this question of what is Afro-Cubanity, to understand, you know, how this problem of, of Cuban society could be solved, understanding the reality that, that you know, that we live and how it affects being black, right? But these arguments brought, brought me to develop an interest in understanding the future of Cuban society and specifically the future of African Cuban life in Havana. So with these questions, I decided to embark in this journey of inserting 
my insider, my insider's voice in the debate on present day Cuban reality and to explore answers to the, to, the, to the question, what is it like to be black in Havana? Through a study of the audible character of Afro-Cuban life and its relationship to Afro-Cuban citizenship in our coalizing milieu. The question, what is it like, obviously, the question, what is it like to be black in, in, in Havana? is molded around Sylvia Winters' question, uh, Sylvia Win Winters' question, what is it like to be black, which, which she framed after Thomas Nago, what's it like to be a bat, right? In this direction, I'm interested then in the ways the category Afro-Cuban describes a sonic manner of being and doing. That is, whether the way we are black and our performance of blackness is shared in the sonic presence of our music in public or private settings across the city. What I'm trying to achieve in this is a description of the character, is a description of the character of my community's collective memory of itself in sound, specifically within the sonorous dimension of Cuba, sorry, of Havana's life world, what Tim Engel um, has described as the weather, uh, which is, I, I believe, is a you know a, a major departure from Mary Schaefer's uh, notion of the soundscape. I think the weather is a more efficient description of our quotidian uh, immersed experience in sound within Havana and other Cuban cities. Perhaps another way to describe what the weather is, is what Julian, Julian Enriquez has described as, open quote, the gaseous medium of air through which sound propagates, end of quote. My question is about the social significance of amplified urban Afro-Cuban music across Havana could also be articulated through Julian, Julian Enriquez's um, uh, suggestion of a sociocultural wave band. In other words, the vibes by which music makes sense and is valued by those who listen to it. Now, I have an example of um, the, that I want to sort of uh, present the first example uh, of this, of this, 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 this space that I, that, that Tim Ingle decides uh, is described as the weather. This is an example of a recording that I of the weather in Santiago de Cuba. Right, so, so, so the case here uh, is to the depart from Julian Enriquez's idea, because actually, what I'm what I'm interested in, it's 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 you know before, besides the fact that, that there are some examples or aspects of Jamaican sound system culture that are practiced locally in in Cuba, I'm more interested in the ways permanent or you know permanent or temporary. Uh, 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 um, Sonic takeover of pedestrian spaces takes place in, in 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 cities like Havana and Santiago de Cuba and other cities in which I've I, in, where I've been, and in how they make signal a citizen citizen exchanges and citizen state exchanges. The idea of a sonic takeover is an adaptation of Umi Vohan's maroon environments, or what Brandon Lavelle urges is the scripting of space through acoustic politics in sonic territories. But applied in, in this case, I'm applying it to our, our Afro-Cuban capacity to distinguish the sonic ubiquity of particularly Afro-Cuban sounds across Havana. I have another example. So every time, I, it's, um, uh, please excuse the fact that this, these ideas will go into this blank. Every time you see this sort of blank screens is I'm about to play something. You know? This is the other example of this, this maroon territories that I'm trying to describe, right? And it's also, 
something that's connected to my opening uh, statement about being able to listen and interpret and analyze and then apply the knowledge that we receive through sound, right? Um, this is a recording that I wanted to play. It's a, it's a video of, especially not video, it's a, it's a video, it's a, a sounded film note of, um, of, uh, of my, my godfather playing uh, one of his godchildren singing uh, religious Afro-Cuban music. Right, so the, this making sense um, in, of uh, this making sense of music, my knowing through sound resonates with how Tina Camp has described after Matthew Morrison the type of impression that frequencies leave on us. Tina Camp was referring to visual frequencies. I'm referring to sonic frequencies, and not only to the impression they leave on us, but also to the relations they re reproduce through our experience of such frequencies. There's, there might be a little bit of you know, theoretical flight here, but just bear with me. What I'm actually talking about is social cultural relations that we reproduce through our discrete or loud playback and listening practices, which is also connected to, um, a, a, to what Wehelie, Alexander Wehelie has argued in this case, that music is transmitted through, uh, it, sorry, music as it is transmitted through different sound technologies provides um, uh, uh, alternative spaces for the articulation of Afro diasporic citizenship. And um, here's another example that I have of this, it, it, sort of a bit more concrete way of seeing how this Afro, this sort of you know, ways of technology is manifesting or allowing to uh, allowing us to articulate particular ways of being citizen in the city happen. It's very short. Right. So, so here the main point of you know of this video, los compadres, is is basically this this point of you know arguing that the presence of those fleeting or permanent sonny sca sonny stages of Afro-Cuban music represent racial and territorial anxieties in connection to what I call the geographical inexistence of a piece of land we can call our own, and the conscious or unconscious mapping scripting is also a good word here of of this sonic territory. That I hypothetically call Afro Cuba. Robin Moore has discussed briefly how, in the 1930s, and this is uh, in the, the book Nationalizing Blackness, how in the 1930s the Workers' Gener Confederation of Cuba considered the creation of a black territory that would comprise some of the island's eastern municipalities. And he's referring to how this, the, the Confederation of Workers was thinking about Santiago, Guantanamo parts of Bayamo to, to basically create them into, into a black, make them into this black province of Cuba within, Cuban, within the Cuban island. Now, here I'm actually referring in this idea of sonic, of anxieties about the issue of land, I'm actually referring to David Crouch's argument after Mark Oje that a nation's anxiety about its, its identity are essentially about space. But my point here is that, Afro the, uh, that the Afro-Cuban claim for space continues to be exerted through Afro-Cuban rap's amplification politics, as we should see during the presentation of, of towards an Afro-Cuban, uh, towards an epistemology of Afro-Cuban rap, the annotated list. So we, we see that later. But I think overall the argument, and I'm trying to bring it back to sort of the, this, this, this world of, of, of uh, hip hop studies. Again, the argument on, uh, on anxieties about space, land and land dispossession, as they appear in, in here in, this, in the context of this text, is called, are conversant with uh, the arguments about hip hop and territoriality. They evoke, for example, the importance 
Trisha Rose's place on the, the post-industrial city as a context that birthed hip hop uh, earliest innovators, Mary Foreman's uh, implications of hip hop spatial, spatial polit, uh, logic, sorry, logics, and the hood as the arena of experience. They also reflect the sense in which Kenny French, uh, uh, Kenneth French talks about uh, the notion of topo musica, and also hip hop polarizing regionalisms like East Coast, West Coast, or Dirty South. In any case, all of them point out to the importance that we Afro diasporans place in in the you know in this issue of finding ourselves unified in a land that we can call our own. So, so it, what I wanted to sort of go back quickly here in this conversation about what what I said about um where you know where Helia, this issue of Afro Afro diasporic citizenship is that this like this 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 performance of Afro diasporic citizenship. It's it's intertwined in, in I think within in within the context of Cuba, with the the Afro-Cuban new woman and new man subjectivity that Cuban socialism was supposed to to produce. I'm not gonna sort of dwell too much on it. We probably can talk about it later. But I feel like in a sense the Afro-Cuban new man, uh, sorry, new woman and new man subjectivities that socialism was supposed to produce were mainly produced through the education that, for example, people like me received in Cuba. And uh, our access, and I'm not saying that hip hop was the only way, but hip hop became a major uh, protocol to which we understood uh, some of the, the the issues that Tanya Saunders talks about in her book, in this becoming part of this larger challenge to the coloniality that exists within the Americas, right? So, um, so yeah, so so uh, my supervisor uh, uh, Hugh Wardle. Has I has urged me to think in this idea, and I'm just closing up this first part of the of the presentation of what my work and my doctoral thesis is about. Um, he said he has urged me to consider what kind of society is being created in that process of scripting in Afro-Cuban territory and sound. Right? What kind of Afro-Cuban futurity are we articulating through sound? So uh, these are right now for me. These are questions that I that I hope I can get to answer at some point. I don't have answers for. I have certain orientations to thinking about, you know, in ways in which I think that this could be, you know, understood. But I don't have arguments to answer the quest those questions yet. And and now I'm moving on to introduce um, my methodology. I hope I'm going slow. Sorry. Um, what I consider the multimodal aspects of 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 my methodology here, what I call methodology. Rather than uh, rather than a push reflection on how the methods I I use I have used help me get to the answers and this is also speaking to the last the last slide I have begun to accumulate is an articulation of the means I have decided to use to disseminate those answers I I always find it fascinating that um, how, you know when others quote Dax Atali whose work on the political economy of music is so foundational to the field of sound studies. Julian Enriquez uh, quotes Atali's contention that the world is not for the beholding, that it is for hearing. It is not legible, but audible, as a way to introduce his orientation of thinking through sound. Personally, I am interested in Atali's suggestion that sounds, that it is sounds, and I, I make this emphasis, that it is sounds and their arrangements that shape societies. And, and and just just this right here is just like just to say that as a black listener, what I hear and the way I hear, and we can talk about later about this idea of the black listener, and uh, the way you know here you know I it's what, uh, this this way that I this way in which I listen is defined by my experience as a black person, but mainly by my practice as an Afro Cuban uh, music producer. So my encounter with Atali's and Enriquez's work was also a way to ground, in theory, what I call my auditory encounter. Uh, uh, Professor John L. Jackson of U University of Pennsylvania, I, I saw him recently explaining his inroads into filmmaking and how using the camera provided ways to understand how we cannot see, right? And seeing in ways we're not able to see before. In his presentation, he referred to Walter uh, Benjamin's discussion of the optical encounter. I make reference to my auditory encounter without you know, signifying other theories about the auditory encounter. I'm thinking about Douglas Kahn and this, this, you know, what Douglas Kahn says about how we went from 
you know, an era of narcissus to the era of eco, right? Um, how how he he this, this talks about you know this this and I'm trying to signify my use of microphones in this case, not specifically uh, in terms of how sampling to make beats because I'm I'm a hip hop producer how sampling to make beats uh, helped me discover the sonorous dimension of Havana, uh, which is another discussion altogether, but rather how listening to the CD through microphones gave me a loose sense of the shape of Havana's sonorous dimension, right? And I, here I'm following Kofi Agawu uh, uh, to say that I use microphones to create field notes that give me access to another angle of that whole, that, that sonorous dimension, which is only accessible in the ethnography, which actually will be possibly construed or manifested or narrated in, you know, through an ethnographer's fictional text. Beyond the fact that, and this is me now thinking, beyond the fact that editing could also be construed as a way to fictionalize the narratives of what we encounter through field work. I believe microphones beat the pencil. That's that's kind of my, my thing. I'm, I'm a sound person, that's just, that's how, that's what I think. So here's another example of, of this, this sonic encounter and how it happened to me. This is a very, very early field, field note, sounded field note that I took in Havana one about street vendors in Havana. Uh, uh, this is recorded from within my, my uncle's um, house and how the, the street vendors walk up, walk down the street selling bread. And then the other one is like, I was like driving from my uncle's house into, into the city and, um, and the guy had, was playing reggaeton. So this is kind of to represent what, how I started thinking about this issue of sound and understanding what the sonorous uh, dimension of Havana was like in its shape. Sorry, it's coming. Seems very faint. Right, so in, in, in this introduction of my methodology, this might be the point to highlight the importance of an African manner of producing and delivering anthropology. This is what Shana Almeida has described as race-based epistemology. In other words, to stress why my kind of anthropology tells an important story. Why my positioning of this perspective started with the question, how do I, as an African man from Havana, a rap music producer, how do I become an anthropologist, right? What kind of anthropology should I do? Potential answers to those questions could begin with a reinterpretation of what Mark Campbell, after Mary Foreman, has described as rapping and representing my African spatial poeticism and historicism within the disciplinary plantation logics of anthropology, where my account as an insider may not amount to much more than a mere native informant playing at being an anthropologist. This interpretation of hip hop 
uh, representing is at the center of my multi multimodal work. But there is also a bit of play, obviously, a bit of play in my relationship with the ways to theorize true thinking, sound, uh, that I, you know, that I, that aren't strictly Afro-Cuban. For example, I use, as you saw in the in the title of this presentation, I use Stephen Fell's term acoustemology, where he has advanced as the agency of knowing the world through sound in my own work. But um, also in terms of the the you know the, the sort of the the aesthetics uh, aspects of my of my own work, besides the fact that I, you know, originally. Uh, I started as a poet uh, in the year eight, 1988, writing poetry, and I found that poetry was something that could help me, you know, say everything that I wanted. Then I went into music and started producing hip hop, and then I somehow felt that where there was lack of having instruments to continue producing music, you know, engaging in this in this project of you know um, of uh, anthropological research would help me have an output for this creativity. So in a sense, this, you know, this, this, this place of multimodality, this place of methodological work through anthropology is also a way to express my own creativity. Uh, you know, not vis-a-vis -vis being an anthropologist, but, you know, side by side, right? Um, but I said to, to just to make sure I give you, I give you some examples. Growing up in Cuba, and in Cuban, you know, in socialist Cuba, I was inspired by the visual aesthetics of the urgency and the urgency, sorry, and the urgency of Santiago Alvarez's uh, cinema. This idea of the letters in, you know, in black over black screen, and but also by, you know, the the lower third embedding of metadata in early American rap videos. This is not a rap video, as you can see. This is Prince and the Revolution. But obviously, Prince is so integral to you know the culture of hip hop, so important to, for hip hop music that I think that that this is a is a really good example. I, in fact, it's actually the the only the only one um, sort of um, screenshot that I thought would make sense of the ones that I found online. So I decided to use this one. So this is basically the end of the the, the discussion of the of methodology, and now I'm I'm going to move on to. Um, Towards an acoustemology of Afro-Cuban rap, uh, the inherently transgressive, trans sorry, transgressive nature of Afro-Cuban uh, rap music, of yeah, of, of urban rap music. Um, uh, um, I should say that th this particular this particular um, 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 presentation came from um, it started came out in the context of in which I presented it last year was. Uh, the panel that we we we, or we convened for EASA 2020 online for Lisbon, and the panel was the title of the panel was "Listening to Transgressive Music: Agustimologies in and from a Changing Caribbean." And this "in and from" is is perhaps the new way to understand, um, uh, you know, uh, sound studies coming from the south. You can see this articulated in the new book, uh, "Remapping Sound Studies" by G Gavin Steingo. And, and Jim Sykes. But I mean, I'm going to read you quickly. There's two parts. I'm going to read you two quickly two, uh, two aspects of this. I'm going to describe what the panel was about. The panel was a continuation of an ongoing discussion uh, on understanding the issue, of, sorry, the use of sound and music as ethnographic methodologies and as a means to present knowledge. The broad concern is with the, is with the relationship between sound and power. What are the conditions, the conditions under which a sound piece is recognized as an object of power? When does music levy social forces? How is sound a political act? We suggest, and this is our, what we, we were saying, our suggestion, I'm reading the text that Carlo Coveto, Professor Carlo Coveto of the University of Stalin put together, right? We suggest that the Caribbean and Caribbean descended music presents itself in complete ethnographic form as a challenge to written ethnographic production in and from the Caribbean. We are interested in examining the ways in which music symbolizes ideology, encourages political action, and constitutes power relation. And, and it's, so it's constitutive of uh, power relations. The Caribbean is dominated by raciological discourses and the continuation of imperialist uh, policies, grassroots uh, expressions of popular music carry an inherent transgressive potential. We ask, how is the music of the abject subject? When does it circulate? What does incomplete citizenry sound like? 
how can it not be transgressive? And in this sense, the panel presented examples of transgressive music in Kingston, Jamaica, San Juan, Puerto Rico, London, uh, uh, in England, and Havana, Cuba. Um, now I'm going to just talk about basically the first, um, the first movement. I see if I can do it uh, in time. The first movement of the basically the first notes of my of my uh, this this presentation of towards an Afro-Cuban, uh, uh, sorry, uh, an Augustomology of Afro-Cuban rap. So my playlist contains rap songs about racism in Havana. My interest is to signify the lyrical and rhythmical evolution of this topic over time. <clears throat> I would like to uh, offer two brief notes to provide uh, listeners, uh, prospective listeners with some context. The first note draws on the recent history of how Cuban socialism <clears throat> is yet to issue, is yet to address the issue of racism. The second note is a brief comment on some of the ideas behind the format in which I will present the, the, the playlist. So the first note says, the notion of Cuba as an unracial society dates back to Cuba's early independence wars from Spain in the late 1800s. After 1959, the Cuban government declared itself an heir of the ideology of an unracial society to solidify popular unity under the socialist revolution. The promotion of an unracial society undermined grassroots activist, uh, sorry, anti-racist activism in Cuba and glossed over centuries of entrenched racist thinking in Cuban society. After the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, Cuba entered its most profound economic crisis in, in its history. To address the, the crisis, the Cuban government <clears throat> resorted to developing the tourism industry. By 1994, the U.S. dollar was declared legal tender in Cuban territory. This process shifted Cuba's social distribution of labor and manifested an important weakness in the ideology and the practice of Cuba's non-racial society. To have or not have access to dollars in Havana resurfaced issues of race and class. Blacks found themselves once more at the bottom of society. Most of our families did not have access to the dollars that exiles Cubans, sorry, exiles Cubans in, in Florida could send their relatives via remittances. We experience a shift from the mundane racial prejudice that has characterized Cuban culture to racism. For many young Blacks like me, rap music became the tool to express our experiences through the crisis. Over time, after Cuban raperos, these are rap artists, forced a national debate on race into Cuba's pop, uh, public sphere. In 2004, the Cuban government dismantled Havana's Afro-Cuban rap scene for its direct critique of Cuba's in colonial, colonialismo interno. What I mean by dismantle is that the Cuban government vision, sorry, the Cuban government's vision of rap music as part of the American apparatus of cultural hegemony is mixed with the racist nation of Cuban culture. The Cuban government closely scrutinized Havana's rap scene for and its international rap festival from 1995 to 2002, when it created the Cuban Rap Agency to co-opt the rap scene. The Cuban government then canceled the 10th anniversary of the rap festival in, 19, in 2004. By 2007, more than 70% of, of Havana's top tier rap artists had either left the country started commercial reggaeton groups, which is nothing bad. Many others simply stopped rapping. The connection between the artists, leaders of the Afro-Cuban rap scene and a large number of important and up and coming underground male and female rap artists have been severed. Contrary to common belief, both in the streets and in scholarly circles, that Afro-Cuban rap died then, I argue that a great deal of Afro-Cuban rap's social critique that energy became imbricated within what I would like to call Afro-Cuban, sorry, the Afro-Cuban lyrical and rhythmical continuum of urban Afro-Cuban genres. This is what Amida Baraka would once call the change in same. In Cuba, it translates as Cuban's use of the rumba clave, which is this, and we can talk about that later, but that, that code, right? the articulation of that code over time and through different 
uh, forms or genders of urban Afro-Cuban music. When Afro-Cuban rap fell, its critical pulse metamorphosed into other more body-centered, dance-oriented genres such as reggaeton and reparto music, also known as ragamorfa, rasta memba, which are basically names that reparto um, are different, uh, basically direct references to Jamaican ragamorphin, dancehall, and reggae music. So my interest here in urban Afro-Cuban music is is it, uh, it's understanding how it is intersected with questions of Afro-Cuban agency and is in, in its skewed and uncomfortable position in Cuba within Cuban contemporary society. A question that may be suggested here is how Afro-Cuban agency and citizenship are performed through music. I would like to argue that Afro-Cuban rap is, is inherently critical and therefore transgressive way of making sense of Cuban society. Afro-Cuban rap presents a, critic, a commentary on racism that opposes the ideology of a racist society unified under the rubric of Cubanity. As mentioned earlier in his 2020, 2015 article, Afro-Cuban intellectual Roberto Surbano described the relationship between, between Cuban socialism and the persistence of racism in Cuban society as colonialismo interno. He said this following Latin American thinkers like Pablo González Casanova, Aníbal Quijano, well, you can also see Quijano and Wallerstein, you can also see Walter Mignolo. But Subano Torres is actually trying to articulate Cuba's internal colonialism as a way to describe a point of departure in how Cuban socialism has elaborated its, its ideological blindness when it comes to anti-Black racism. This ideological blindness is expressed in the government's long silence. And this is obviously a, a reference to uh, Professor Saunders' work, right? About the you know, about how the topic of anti anti black racism dis discrimination, these issues of social inequality, and and the government re government's refusal to acknowledge its presence in Cuban society. The second note is basically a note to describe what you know, sort of fantasizing in some way the format of an Afro Cuban uh, anthropology, right? Uh, and, and the point in, of, of this second note is to provide context to the format in which I'm presenting the annotated list at the heart of this presentation, <clears throat> in which I have you know, embedded a, a playlist in, black, uh, in a black video-like video -like digital environment where texts coexist with sounds and music only as brief annotations. I did so to explore and challenge, again, anthropologists' persistent need to justify via disciplinary textuality, the strength of sound and music as complete ethnographic forms. My aim is not, is not, only, is, 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 is not only to articulate potential answers to the questions, what would a sounded anthropology be? Or what would happen if we began to consider sound recordings in themselves, truly consider sound recordings in themselves and not call them sound art uh, as meaningful forms and not just sources and not just the sources of data to assist our writing. Following Gavin Stango and Jim Sykes and Ana Maria Ochoa, I'm also using this format to perform my personal Afro-Cuban decolonized mode of thinking about and listening to sound. I'm also using this format to present my way of making sense in sound. And this, I'm gonna present uh, the, the annotated list now. Anónimo consejo, revolución, ah. Anónimo consejo, revolución, yo, yo soy el hijo Quino, revolución, no me la aprietes más, que yo sigo aquí, no me la aprietes más, déjame vivir, por mi Cuba lo doy todo, soy feliz, y, y tú, tú sigues, sigues reprendido en mí, suéltame a mí, oh. no me la aprietes más, que yo sigo aquí, no me la aprietes más, déjame vivir, por mi Cuba lo doy todo, soy feliz, y, y tú, tú sigues, sigues reprendido sigue. en mí, suéltame a mí, oh. Oh. Te confundas con la arena que pisas dos pasos más y se te recuerda que estás en área divisa. Para ver o bicho. Todo no es como lo pintan y yo sigo aquí. Aquí. De frente a los problemas. Ah. Aguantando con mi mano el hierro caliente. Sin pasarme por la mente. Coger una base y probar suerte en otro día. A 90 millas. Todo no es como lo pintan y yo sigo aquí. aquí. Cada paso en la calle es una preocupación. Extranjero en busca de comunicación con la población. Cinco minutos de conversación. Policía en acción sin explicación. 
andando para la estación. Trabajes o no trabajes, ellos, ellos no pueden creer que estés hablando de cualquier otra cosa que no sea de negocio. De madre socio. Principales cívicos nacionales e internacionales han de contar con mis descomunales verbales. Burbujeo, flow en manantiales, dar a los pedales que recogen bien. Tú sabes, tú sabes. Tú sabes, caso grave, suave no cabe, duro pa' que no se crabe, quien sabe no se intromete, así se empina te den micro como paseo del machete, se empinó, lucha por Cuba, lucha por Jepa, y hazlo cubano, urbano, mal hermano, porque esto es, es la ciudad que tú te vas por encima, tú eres así, que tú te vas por encima. Sandunguera, que tú te vas por encima. Tú eres así, que tú te vas por encima. Yo, 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 yo,
Thank you. That's it. Um, that's me. I've done it. I've done it. <laughs> I don't know if you can you hear me? Anyone? Can you guys hear me? Hello? Yes. Yes, yes. yes. So yeah, that's that's it. That's it. Finish up. Okay. <laughs> uh, can, can you hear me? Can yep. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Thank you, Pablo. Um, I was listening with uh, Mitai in the other room, so on the on the YouTube channel. That was freaking amazing. Um, I'm Thank gonna you. go ahead and open it up to the students because. I could dominate this, this this conversation very easily and I don't want to do that. Um, <laughs> so folks can feel free to go ahead and turn on their cameras. Um, and so are there any questions? No questions. Give people a I'm gonna start asking to I'm gonna start, I'm gonna start calling people. What do you think about this? <laughs> and um, let me see if there are any people post posting questions on YouTube. So we got some likes. Okay, Carmen. I see. Do you have a question? And anyone else can go ahead and feel free to go while while Carmen's typing her question. I have a question. Um, hi, um, my name's Victoria. Um, I, I don't know how exactly to articulate this, but I just want to know, like, maybe like your thoughts or like, um, any conversation that's included in this, like regarding like, kind of like the appropriation of like, specifically, like, I feel like Afro-Cuban like rap and like reggaeton from like, specifically like, like white Latinx artists that are like, um, <laughs> like I don't know I just I want to know like I know it's kind of like a diff I feel like it's an, an, a frustrating conversation but I def it's definitely like I feel like sometimes a necessary one to like name it um but yeah that, that was like my question so the you're saying the appropriation of like a bad bunny right um I, I mean in, the, in a sense I don't I don't I wouldn't say that they appropriate um Afro-Cuban rap or um well, for giving reggaeton, I, I I would I would say in many ways a lot of the people that I know, rappers in Havana, it's a long on, ongoing conversation with Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. with the Dominican Republic, with Jamaica, with Panama, um, about music circulation, right? So, mm -hmm. this is a uh, you know in the sense what you're seeing emerging, you know, in the in the commercial scene of music, and also on the ground is this 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 structure that that 
that uh, you know that that happens of how people communicate, right? How we are citizens not just of one country, but of a region, right? And how this 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 connection to a region is historical as well, and it's you know in many ways a, an ongoing communication that you know has been happening. You know, if you you want to go to back to the Tainos and the Caribes, and how people went you know in, in boats from a little canoas, if you want to call it from, you know, from island to island, you know, island hopping. In, in, in that same way, the airwaves, right, sounds, it's a manifestation of that connection as well, right? And, and, and I think, I think, I mean, I know many people who, you know, lots of Cuban rap uh, and Afro-Cuban rap is, is massively in debt. People acknowledge that they, they drank from Vico C, from Borico Guerrero, from uh, you know uh, you know Apache in Venezuela from Cancerbero so that the, the, that this connection I wouldn't say this exactly an appropriation of of Afro Cuban because actually this is a language that's transnational right so in this transnational uh, you know uh, nature of the, the music it's it's okay for anyone to use that idiom to express themselves right mm-hmm. now in the case of Cuba the issue that I've had in the past. Particularly with with the, the the incursion or the emergence of reggaeton music, what I didn't understand is where and how Cuba, uh, to say, pulsated in a particular you know in a particular uh, vibration that I did not that I had not thought about, and it's this this Caribbean vibration is the clave that I talked about earlier. Then, in a sense, because uh, hip hop is a, is an Afro or African American oriented music, or it's oriented around, or it's been shaped around the Caribbean and also the African the African American experience. Pablo, I'm going to ask you a favor. I'm sorry to interrupt you. We would, I would like to switch things up. We're in the class portion of this now. There's one person who has a question from YouTube. For people who may not be comfortable with having their cameras on while we're streaming on YouTube, feel free to shut them off. And then we'll just put them back on when we stop the streaming on YouTube. Um, But we're gonna ask the one question from a person from YouTube, and then um, we'll just go back to the the class. That's fine, that's fine, that's fine. And then you can, if if that's cool, you can just start there. Is that cool? Okay. so the question is- Sorry about that. I'll, t- I'll get back to that, to the point. Go ahead. No, no, you know me, yes, because I was actually going to ask Krista to do that and I, I just totally forgot to do it in that don't section. Don't worry, don't worry. Um, okay, so the question is, uh, it's a question about relations, the relationship between territory and sound. Could you elaborate a bit more on that relationship in the case of the Afro-Cuban community? And could the expansion of sound somehow relate back to the control of territory? The, did you say control? Yep. The control of territory. Yeah, could the, could the expansion of sound somehow relate to a lack of control of territory? Sorry. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, initially how I arrived to thinking about this particular issue of territoriality in, in the case of of Afro-Cubans was through reading David Crouch's, um, uh, I think it's William Lane, a psychosocial, I forget the rest of that. But basically the discussion in that book about William Lane, is this issue of how in Australia, white settlers have this issue of knowing, it, understanding, you know, psychologically and emotionally that they don't, that, that Australia is not the land where they're from, mm-hmm. right? The soil of Australia did not produce the white settler, and and that causes an anxiety that that continues to be a problem. Even though you're settled somewhere, you know that you that this is not where you're from, and you behave differently based on that, uh, on that understanding of that psychosocial uh, uh, um, relation. I took that to think about how we feel in Cuba, and some of the responses based on what you know. You know, if you have read Paul Gilroy, when he talks about this issue of this point of no return, that we're not going back to Africa, right? And we've decided this is our land. We're going to be here. But in many, in many ways, defining being Cuban, being Afro-Cuban, and understanding where you're from, and you not only your positionality as a, as, a, as an Afro-Cuban, uh, you know, citizen, or a Cuban citizen, uh, as someone who be, who belongs within the territory of Cuba 
the issue of having land and, and knowing that this is something you own allows you to feel and have a different response to your environment and and your and and defining who you are in in terms of this identity politics like right? how i how do i define myself as cuban is also implicated with these issues of knowing that i've never belonged in this land that i should be going somewhere else but i i don't i have decided not to go anywhere else and also the opportunity for me to leave cuba like in the cases for example like you had the 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 black star who was also in havana and you know Marcus Garvey came to Cuba around in 1926 to you know, make sure that you know people had a way to return or a passage to return back to Africa. All of that is gone. Socialism, socialism allowed us to think that we were part of Cuba again. But then socialism in the beginning produced the, the agrarian reform and the urban reform, but none of those completed this issue of land for Afro-Cubans. And this is quite this is quite problematic because in many ways. Uh, it's, it's, I think it's a conversation that's just something to start. Uh, it's really interesting that in the past, it's something that's been discussed. And, and I, I was quite glad to have found that information also in Robin, Book's, Robin Moore's book, uh, Nationalizing Blackness, where he talks about how you know, the Confederation of Workers was thinking about instituting or establishing this black territory, right? So this is kind of where I started thinking about it. Uh, and and my my point is that if we if we in this question of what exactly is this issue that hip hop music or you know or urban music in Cuba keeps on talking about in terms of not only the future or you know in the way in which it is also a prophecy of the future of Cuban society, the issue of land possession becomes a very important issue, like Sylvia Winter has talked about, Joy Robbins has talked about that too. Uh, uh, Nelson Maldonado Torres also talks talk about the importance of, you know, the AQ mean and being in the world. And this experience of being in the world, that you know, knowing that you have a connection to the soil, to the land, is really important. This is where I where I put it. I think it's problematic in the case in the case of Cuba because it's a it's a challenge. It's, it's something that we may have thought that it's already resolved, but it, I don't think it is. And, and you know, and and uh, what happens is in the same way that you might find in other localities. Blacks and Afro Cubans and be blacks who live in Cuba, the black experience is an experience in which you are trapped in the place. And you, you but you don't know if you belong to it. In, in your ways of defining that belonging to that to that place is something that needs to be constructed. My imagination and my belief is that that construction of that nation is producing sound because it's what we really can 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 control, right? And the reality that we can control and produce is that is that space and sound. Now, the other point of that, religiously, is that um, around 2001, I spoke to a Babalao friend of, of mine, and in he, his 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 um uh, uh, sort of elucidations, he said, Can, could, "Would you imagine uh, a society where everyone would have ifa, would have been initiated, and they would know?" the prophecy of their life, what, what they're meant to be doing in, in this world, in this life. Everyone would know what they're born to be and what they're born to do, right? So if that is the case, if we listen to the music that I, that example that I played you earlier about this, how this, this is maroon environments that Uli Bohan talks about. He talks about Palenque Sonoro, right? What are those Palenque Sonoros? This Palenque, you know, Palenque is a territory, right? So it's a presentation of a, of a land that does not exist, you know, the, you know the, in, in any other way, put in sound. We can go to the case of the Abacuas. The Abacuas produce their own tierras in, through juegos, the lodges. And they have a place, a fundamental, that they say, this is my, this is my area. I belong here. And this, you know, through sacrifices to ritual, they proclaim and, you know, claim the land themselves. So I, I think these connections and the fact that many raperos are Abacua, many raperos have connections to religious, that this is perhaps not consciously, but perhaps also consciously, there's just also a, a message and a commentary that's, in, that's within the nature of African or urban rap music or urban music, if you want to say that. All right, so it looks like we don't have any other questions. Um, 